Are you upbeat on the U.S. right now? Uh, no, Aaron, I don't think the data is bullish at all. For example, the data point you just gave, uh, you talk about lower gas prices giving consumers more discretionary income. Well, lower gas prices put more money in their pockets. It doesn't mean they're going to spend it. They could use it to pay off debt, pay off credit cards, pay off their kids' student loans, pay down a mortgage, et cetera. In other words, there's an alternative to spending, which is saving or reducing debt, which is the same thing. So this easy connection between you know, more money in their pockets and spending, that sort of treats the consumer like an automaton who doesn't know what to do with the money. He's just going to go out and spend it by the ninth TV set. That's not what happens in the real world. In the real world, people are deleveraging and saving. So that's not particularly bullish. The other thing, gas prices going down, that's deflationary. Deflationary blows up the debt to GDP ratio, puts the U.S. on the path to Greece. In other words, deflation increases the real value of debt. We have a debt problem in this country. So why is increasing the real value of the debt bullish? That's the Fed's worst nightmare. So none of this is good at all. Um, would put it, let me put it differently. I don't consider these bullish indicators. They tell me that the economy is running out of steam. You know, an economy is nothing more than, than two things. It's how many people are working, how productive are they? You can slice and dice it any way you want. You can take GDP and divide it into government and private exports, imports. There are a lot of ways to finesse the data. But at the end of the day, how many people are working, how productive are they? Well, guess what? Labor, labor force participation is going down, which means fewer people are working. And productivity, productivity recently is actually going down. It had expanded for a long time, but going down lately. Real wages are stagnant. Uh, 50 million people are on food stamps. Um, you know, 7 million people have part-time jobs, which they have full-time jobs. So the kind of thing you mentioned, this is noise. I mean, these are day-to-day -day data points that people get spun up about, and you get a lot of happy talk around them, but they're not, they're not the real story. Jim, a lot of people are concerned about Europe, and Reuters uncovered deep divisions at the ECB, and apparently the head of the ECB and the head of Germany's central bank, they hardly speak. So does Europe need another economic crisis for them to circle the wagons? Well, we're in a global depression. I mean, there are, there's slowdown in uh, China, Japan, uh, Europe, certainly. Uh, I just described how the U.S. is slowing down. So the whole world's in a global depression. So there are enough problems to go around. But in a fight between the ECB and Germany, Germany wins. So uh, I don't look for much change. I mean, you know, ECB, there was a whole buzz uh, today about ECB buying assets as if they're doing quantitative easing. I mean, they bought about uh, $2.5 billion worth of assets, you know, versus the, the Fed which has been doing almost a trillion dollars a year, a trillion dollars a year, and the ECB does 2.5 billion, that, that's nothing. So yeah, they're, they're going through the motions, but they're not doing anything like QE. They're not buying sovereign debt. Uh, they're buying some massive back securities, and there aren't even enough of those to have much of an impact. So Draghi, uh, Draghi I do think, is the best central banker in the world. He, he understands that central banks are essentially impotent, and when you're impotent, you have to talk a good game. So Draghi, you know, he, he says little and does less. The Fed is the opposite. The Fed doesn't quite understand how impotent they are, so they're out there yakking all day long and giving speeches and, and all that. But at the end of the day, um, central banks don't make that much of a difference. They can cause inflation and deflation. Uh, they can make things worse with bad policy, but they can't make things better. To get out of a depression, you need structural changes. You need things coming from uh, leadership, which there's a lack of in the United States these days. But, you know, the Congress, the White House, or in Europe, the individual governments, the 17 or 18 now members of the uh, of the euro uh, of the eurozone, need to make structural changes. Those are things like labor force mobility, um, you know, uh, a fair labor standards act in the United States, building the key pump, Keystone Pipeline, infrastructure, social costs. These are the structural changes. You know, taxes. These are the fiscal and structural changes that have to be made to get us out of a depression. The, uh, you know, this unbounded faith in central bankers is nonsense. They've done nothing but uh, you know, run. The, they, they are capable of, of destroying wealth, but they're not capable of creating it. So, Jim, how much you know, can easy money help if it leads to cheap euro, say, dollar euro parity? Let me just listen to your question there. How can easy money help at all? I mean, printing money doesn't create jobs. Central banks don't create jobs. As I mentioned, we need, we need structural changes. Now, the, the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is um, an economy is just you know, working at how big is the labor force, how productive are they? That's all there is. Now, with labor force participation going down and productivity going down, there's no way the economy can expand except by credit creation. You can create credit, but all you do when you do that, the easy money, you don't actually create real wealth, you create asset bubbles. But then the bigger the asset bubble gets, it explodes, it does more harm than good, puts you actually back worse than where you started. So that's, that's sort of what we're heading for now. So how does the current struggle in Europe fit into your currency wars thesis? Well, it's part of the currency wars. Uh, the currency wars, uh, as you know, started in 2010. I talk about this in my, my first book, uh, Currency Wars. Um, and the point I made at the time was that we're not always in a currency war, but when we are, they can go on for 5 or 10 or 15 years. So I'm not at all surprised that 
for a currency war that started in 2010. Here we are in 2014, and it's still going on. Now, a lot of journalists and reporters, you know, when, when there's a big story, um, you know, we see the Brazilian real uh, collapsing uh, with the with the re-election of uh, Rousseff and others. They say, well, the currency wars are back on, but but they never went away. The currency wars don't go away. They just have you know sort of high points and then quiet periods. But um, you know, we've come through a recent period of the strong dollar. Well, the strong dollar is deflationary. By the way, currency wars are an alternative to interest rates. Interest rates and, and exchange rates are just re reciprocal to each other to a great extent. So when you're at the zero bound, which the central banks are, one way to ease is by cheapening your currency. Well, the opposite is true. When your currency gets stronger, that's a tightening move. So the combination of Fed tapering and a stronger dollar, which is what we've seen over the last year and a half, is very deflationary from the U.S. perspective. It's one of the reasons the U.S. economy is slowing down. So those policies probably have to be reversed. I would look for um, certainly um, uh, you know, possibly QE4 next year and a weaker dollar, stronger euro as easy moves on the part of the U.S. The U.S. has tolerated a strong dollar and gone through tapering because we mistakenly believed that our economy was getting a lot stronger based on second quarter GDP. But a lot of that was just inventory accumulation. You look at the first half as a whole, if you back out inventory accumulation and replace it with final sales, the economy grew you know, less than 2%, which is what it's been doing for the last five years. That's, that's a depression, uh, that's a depression uh, defined as, you know, a depression doesn't mean declining GDP, it just means below trend GDP. If your GDP trend is 3.5% in the long run and can be 5 or 6% in the short run as you bring labor back into the workforce, and you're actually growing about 1.9. That, that's depressed growth. That's what a depression is, and, and that's what we're in right now. So I expect the currency wars to continue. Um, Europe got a little lift you know, from a cheaper euro that is uh, designed to get some inflation into Europe because they have a big deflation problem now. But it's as if the U.S. Uh, you know, put the euro in the lifeboat, but now we've got to kick them out because we need the lifeboat ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, speaking of problems, Danone and Unilever reported uh, soft consumer demand in China, and it seems like the housing slowdown is crimping household balance sheets. So what impact will this have, Jim? Well, China is the biggest credit bubble in the world. I mean, we just spoke about how the U.S. has created asset bubbles in housing and stocks with easy money, and that's true. But there's no bigger bubble in the world than China. They have a greater capacity to keep it going because their investors have fewer alternatives. You know, a Chinese middle-class investor or saver, they're not allowed to invest in foreign stocks. They don't like to invest in their own stock market because uh, it's had its own problems. It's been very weak. Um, they have invested in real estate, but they've created a bubble, and they're now backing away from that. They don't want to leave their money in the bank because they get kind of 25 basis points or something. So what they, they have invested in, the, the only two alternatives are gold, which they're buying in enormous quantities. You look at the uh, purchases coming out of the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're astounding. They're in the thousands of tons. Uh, per month, which is uh, you know, an enormous amount of gold. Uh, but the other alternative are these wealth management products. Well, the wealth management products, they're just uh, you know, CDOs, like collateralized debt obligations. The, the, the banks that, that issue them or, or sponsor them, they're not bank guaranteed products, by the way. They're not bank deposits, but they're sold through banks. They take the money and invest it in worthless real estate. So the, the saver, the investor, thinks she's getting you know, a 5 or 6% yield uh, on a, a nice, you know, it's a, it's a high yield instrument, but they don't quite realize that A, the bank doesn't stand behind it, B, the money's being put into worthless real estate that can't pay off the debt. So that's a Ponzi scheme waiting to collapse. So, you know, you look around at China, you've got a housing bubble ready to collapse, you've got a wealth management product Ponzi ready to collapse. Um, now, China does have enormous reserves that they can use to bail out their banking system, but they tend to be very slow decision makers. In a financial crisis, uh, slow decision making is fatal because it allows the panic to spread before you can get on top of it. So probably what Chinese banks will do is, you know, if you've got depositors, you know, banging at your door for their money back and you look at your balance sheet and you've got a, on the asset side and you've got a bunch of dud real estate projects that you can't sell and perhaps you have some U.S. stocks and bonds, you're going to sell the U.S. stocks and bonds because they're liquid. That's how the contagion will go from China to the U.S. and spread around the world. So um, I'm not sure which is going to collapse the system first, something in the U.S. or something in China. Either one is a possibility. A few other wild cards in the deck like this uh, Swiss gold referendum coming up on, uh, at the end of November. Before we continue, help us by smashing that YouTube like button and subscribe now to this channel. This shows the algorithm that you value the information and it helps us spread this message. Sharing is caring. Please like and subscribe now. Thank you. And now, let's continue. Jim, how far does Chinese growth have to fall to make a successful rebalancing a possibility? 
Well, it's, um, you know, China's about 10% um, uh, of global GDP, so if it fell by half from the, let's say, the 7.5% range to the, maybe the 4% range, uh, somewhere in there, that's going to knock, uh, you know, kind of five points off of uh, a global GDP, so that's a lot. Uh, so, uh, um, now, but, but again, this will add to the deflation. Uh, the problem is, uh, uh, I, I don't see the rebalancing, because the rebalancing, the rebalancing is supposed to be from investment to consumption in China, inside China. Uh, the problem is uh, most of the investment has been wasted. It's 45% of their GDP. If you start reducing the investment component, uh, that has to, because it's such a large percentage of GDP, that has to go down faster than the consumption piece can come up. And if you have a, a, a credit crisis in China, that's going to ding confidence and make consumption even tougher. So it's hard to see how China uh, gets out of that. They've been trying to cheapen their currency, again, back to the currency wars. Uh, but I think the U.S. has probably got limited tolerance for that. So um, there's sort of no, there's, the, thing is, the thing is, Aaron, there's no good way out of this through monetary policy because monetary policy cannot solve a structural problem. The whole world needs to restructure. Uh, you know, Japan, U.S., China, and Europe all need to restructure. Of those four areas, the only one that's actually doing the restructuring is Europe. That's why their growth is suffering because that's part of the price you pay. But the U.S. and China and Japan are trying to pretend that everything's okay. But by not making the structural adjustments now, they're going to have worse collapses later. Where will oil go if China continues to go away from infrastructure and ex export-led growth? Well, you know, China is uh, uh, becoming one of the world's largest oil importers. Um, they, they may be uh, at that point already. They have enormous demand for energy. Of course, they burn a lot of coal, but coal is, you know, poison the air and, and poison the water over there. So there, there are limits on that. Uh, but, you know, if China slows down, they'll, uh, they'll, they might use less. Um, the thing is, uh, oil energy prices move on three vectors. The three vectors are, one is, you know, basic supply and demand. So what are, what are the industrial uses or industrial inputs and what's the supply side? Supply side looks very good right now and to the extent the economy is slowing down, that's, that uh, weakens the demand for it. There's some talk that maybe Saudi Arabia is purposely uh, suppressing the price of oil to put pressure on the Russians to back away from their support for Assad in Syria. I haven't seen any direct evidence of that. I don't expect to. That would be the kind of thing that would be a very closely held secret between uh, the major governments of the world, but I don't think you can rule that out. Uh, the other factors are, you know, inflation, deflation. Well, we just talked about how the world's deflating, so that tends to put downward pressure. The third factor is geopolitical. Um, you know, even with the Islamic State, the interesting thing about the Islamic State is they're pumping oil. You know, there's all these trouble, there are trouble spots all over the Middle East, but all of them want to pump oil. We saw uh, something similar happened in uh, 1986 in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, a lot of people said, oh, gee, the two biggest or two of the biggest oil powers are at war. Uh, that's going to cause uh, disruption in supply and cause the price to go up. And I said, no, it's the exact opposite. When you're at war, you need the money, so you pump more and it brings the price down. I think the price of oil went down to like $12 a barrel at that time, maybe a little bit less. So, um, uh, so with all the turmoil in the Middle East, unless people start actually you know, blowing up fields and uh, you know, sinking tankers, which is not going to happen because the U.S. military would prevent that, um, they actually would, they would tend to produce more to get money to prop up their wars, uh, which is what happened in the mid-1980s. So uh, all of the arrows are sort of pointing downward at this point, so you might even see even lower oil prices. You know, how can the Russian economy cope with this? Well, uh, they might have to uh, hunker down a little bit. Uh, you know, Russia, I've, I've always understood, is not a real functioning economy. It's more of a, a, um, a kleptocracy with a bunch of gangsters basically skimming, um, skimming the oil revenues. So there might be a little bit less to go around for the oligarchs, although I don't think there are any uh, hardship cases. Um, but uh, look, Putin will probably, you know, he might uh, actually cause trouble, more trouble on the international scene to distract attention from the internal economic problems. That's a classic strategy. You might see that in China, in East Asia, and you might see it in Russia, in Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. In other words, when leaders feel uh, that they're in danger of losing support, um, they might cause uh, foreign, uh, you know, invade foreign countries, invade their neighbors, cause other types of geopolitical problems to, you know, kind of pump up national pride, distract attention from their economic problems. That's the oldest trick in the book. So one of the things Putin might do is just kind of more adventure, adventurism. He gave a, a very interesting speech uh, over the weekend. I think he was participating in a a very prominent think tank conference, and uh, he said the uh, you know the the bear the bear is master of the taiga. The taiga is the Russian uh, uh, sort of primeval plain and forest. And uh, when he said the bear, of course, he meant Russia, and he was warning the United States to keep out of the Russian sphere of influence. So um, that's uh, I think is a pretty good uh, indication of uh, of what Russian foreign policy is these days. So they might actually be more adventuresome and cause more problems very possible. So, you know, where do you expect flashpoints to occur if oil prices continue to stay weak? 
Well, there are flashpoints all over the world. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the South China Sea, the, uh, the well, geopolitical flashpoints would be, you know, South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands uh, between uh, China and Japan, obviously uh, Ukraine, um, Central Asia, uh, Venezuela could blow up. Uh, so these are all uh, potential problems. But I, I would say that we sort of see all of them. Uh, these things could get worse. Ebola is another one, the Islamic State. It's a long list, unfortunately. These things could all get worse, but they're all on the radar screen. The thing that I'm more concerned about that could really, uh, you know, cause a financial panic and cause the sort of house of cards to collapse is the thing that we don't see, the thing that we're not thinking about. Uh, that could be something like, um, you know, an unexpected bank collapse or an unexpected uh, failure to deliver gold by an exchange or a major broker, something more like an MF Global where it kind of comes out of nowhere catches people by surprise and starts a liquidity crunch. So that's, I think that's probably more, tr more troubling than the, uh, the geopolitical flashpoints because at least we can see those and discount them to some extent. Now, I understand bond markets are concerned because Venezuela may default. So if they did, given Argentina already defaulted, could there be contagion? Sure. Uh, you know, when uh, the, the question is when somebody defaults, you can see the defaults coming. What you don't know is who are, the, who are the creditors. You don't necessarily know that. You may have some information on that. So it's sort of like... Uh, when AIG failed, the, the, the big loser wasn't AIG, it was Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, you know, was probably uh, insolvent or close to insolvent uh, at the time. And, and the bailout of AIG was really a bailout of the, of the major creditor, which was Goldman Sachs. So the same thing is true today. When you see Venezuela collapsing, you have to say, well, okay, we know who the debtor is, who are the lenders, where's the, where's the uh, you know, the, the AIG that's, um, that's in line after Lehman or the Goldman that's in line after AIG. What's the next domino that's about to fall? That's, that's harder to know. Um, and uh, so, uh, again, that's true all over the world. It does kind of remind you of the uh, 1930s when these failures started popping up. People started going off the gold standard, defaulting on their debts, imposing capital controls, et cetera. And then there was a, a super catalyst with the uh, failure of credit on stalled in, in 1931, but, uh, but there were some warning signs ahead of that. I, I do see the warning signs today. Any thoughts on Japan, Jim? Uh, they've been in depression for 25 years, and if they don't make some changes, they'll be in depression for another 25 years. <laughs> this goes, okay. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You can't print uh, or deficit finance your way out of a uh, um, depression, at least if you're wasting the money, which they do. There are people in Japan who say, you know, the road in front of my house has been paved, you know, five times in the last, uh, you know, 10 years. It doesn't need that much paving. Um, there are things that Japan could do structurally that would help. Uh, cut taxes, uh, allow greater immigration, uh, empower women, increase the role of women in their economy. What to do in such a situation? Inform yourself and keep your financial education strong. We from the Compact Group offer our loyal subscribers a free educational portal with firsthand monetary, financial, and economic knowledge. Enter our invite-only Insider Club by clicking the link below. You will get access to first-class information far earlier than the rest. We have prepared a special deal for all our members where you can access a giant pool of Robert Kiyosaki's financial wisdom for just $1. To find out more, simply click the link below and join our Insider Club absolutely free. But there is more you can and should do. Build up several streams of income. More and more people realize that they have to take their future in their own hands but they don't know how and where to start. We from Compact offer our Insider Club members unique opportunities. Strengthen your financial muscle and get the edge. Click the link below. Become part of our free Insider Club. No financial obligations. But there's one important thing you have to know. You have to become active. So do it now. Become active and see you on the other side.